The Super Bowl is just four days away, but security in Houston is tightening over President Trump's executive orders. Officials are vowing to support peaceful protesting. They are expecting to balance that, though, with more than one million spectators. Homeland Security official Chip Fulgham saying yesterday how important the security is to get right. Security is always our top priority. And we look to balance that with minimal inconvenience to the fans as they experience the event. And speaking of the fans, they are a tremendous resource to ensure the safe and secure uh, game. They are, in fact, our extra eyes and ears. I urge each of you to remember, if you see something, say something, and act by immediately reporting to local authorities. Joining us right now is former CIA contractor, author of Enhanced Interrogation, and the man who interrogated 9-11 mastermind Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. James Mitchell is with us right now. James, good to see you. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Thank you. We have a lot to talk to you about. We're thrilled you're here. Let me kick it off with what we've just been reporting. How difficult will this task be for officials? Uh, this is America's fourth largest city. Obviously, a lot of tensions are high right now uh, around uh, immigration and the potential for terrorists. Well, the good thing is, is it's not the first time they've done this. I think they've done that several other times, maybe three other times. So probably they have a lot of lessons learned. And the newer, more uh, difficult to uh, put in place security measures are, are, are justified given the threat that's, that's there. My impression is that the trend in lately in terrorist attacks have been on softer targets, and this is not going to be a soft target. So while it's possible, it's, it's not uh, highly probable. Let me, let me ask you, sir, as the, the individual who, who did uh, interrogate the 9-11 mastermind, Khalid Sheikh uh, Mohammed, give us your take on, on what interrogation should look like. I mean, here we have a new administration. You know, Donald Trump has voiced his opinions on this. And, and, and from your standpoint, being on the ground, what do you think the tactics should be? Well, for the majority of people, I, I think the Army Field Manual and uh, standard law enforcement techniques are probably all you need. Right now, standard law enforcement techniques are, are not available to the intelligence community. They're restricted to the Army Field Manual. And my objection to just the Army Field Manual is that it's published online. They not only tell you which interrogation techniques they use, but how they expect them to work. So it's basically a, a manual on how to defeat our interrogations of detainees. And in addition to that, they make it clear that what they're doing is seeking voluntary statements. So if we are in another situation where there's a potential catastrophic attack and they have a terrorist who could provide us with that information, I personally am hoping that the mall cop down the street from me has him or my local sheriff's department has him or the FBI instead of the intelligence communities because the only thing standing between us and another attack like 9-11 is whether or not the person we're questioning volunteers to tell us that information. Wow. James, it's Dagan McDowell. Do you believe that we are less safe because we've backed away from some of these more harsh interrogation techniques? Well, I don't know if we need to go back to waterboarding. Like, uh, you know, I don't want to be the postal boy for waterboarding. That only happened three times, and that was to stop these catastrophic attacks that KSM had, in, had planned. Uh, but in my mind, some form of legal coercion is apt to be necessary, and I want to underline that notion of legal coercion. Right now, like I said, the intelligence community depends solely on what the terrorist is willing to voluntarily provide, and my guess is that may work for the folks who are fighting because, you know, ISIS has uh, taken over their, their uh, village and they either fight with ISIS or they die, but that's not going to work with a guy like KSM who was the mastermind behind 9-11. In fact, when I ask him uh, for information to stop operations inside the United States, what he said to me was he sniggered and he, and he looked at me arrogantly and he said, soon you'll know. And I just don't think he would have volunteered information that would have helped us stop Hambali's second wave of attacks. What was that like for you? Well, you know, I was at that point, I was in the neutral world. I was, I was doing a neutral assessment. It, it was chilling in the sense that I thought, oh, my gosh, this guy's going to be tough. Um, but at the same time, 
I knew that it was important that we proceed as distasteful as it was personally to me and as morally objectionable as it was personally to me. I didn't think that he had the right to keep that information secret or that that, because he's not a member of the, he's not a, you know, he's not a, an American citizen. And I, and, and I didn't think that his desire to keep it secret superseded my obligation to try to save American lives. One of the questions I have about the intelligence community, we're talking about interrogation and whether or not we're less safe now, but overall, does the intelligence community think that we are overall more or less safe than we were before? And are they going to be wor working with the, the Trump administration? Um, a lot of people are saying they might not be cooperating as much as Trump would like us to think he is. Well, my experience in the intelligence community is that they're professionals. Once you get the political appointees out of the way, the men and women in the intelligence community are, are Americans. They love America. They're patriots. They're willing to sacrifice and die. And so if you can get the politics out of it, which is what they would like to do, their job is to provide reliable information to the decision makers so that they can implement whatever their policy is. They have no vested interest, the career ones do, in, uh, uh, you know, propping up some president. Yeah, so but I mean, we, he, we don't know how deep the, the politicizing goes, right? I mean, look what just happened. The, you know, assistant attorney general refused to carry out Donald Trump's order and she was pushed out. You know, she, she was fired as a result. I mean, so we don't really know when, where the politicizing stops, right? Well, they do inside of the building. Okay. And normally what happens is a new director will bring in his key staff with him uh, and, and uh, you know, they'll, they'll uh, find other jobs or remove those people who are political appointees yeah. who are in, intent on propping up the last administration. L let me ask you, James, about this, uh, what's happening in terms of the, the last executive order, uh, this temporary ban of visas. Obviously, now Iran is trying to push back, saying that it's going to, you know, limit uh, and, and stop visas uh, for Americans going to Iran. What's your take on this? Why, why would we expect them to do anything different? Iran, uh, their primary task really is to kind of poke their finger in our eye as often as they can. So all they're trying to do is generate confusion and dissent among the Americans. It's, they're aiming for our minds uh, not so much our immigration policy, because what they're trying to do is disrupt the peaceful flow of our government. So I'm not surprised that they do that stuff, and I don't think anybody would be. All right, we will leave it there. James Mitchell, good to have you on the program this morning. Thanks so much, sir. Thank you, ma'am. We'll